Apartheid did not die, it was privatized. That's the subject of the latest book that I've just written, The New Apartheid. Let's get into it. Spread the fire fam, welcome back to SMWX and if you're new around here, my name is Dr. Sizwe Mbofu Walsh and on this channel, the Sizwe Mbofu Walsh Experience, we explore South African politics through interviews and analysis. And today, I'm really excited because after three years of hard work, I get to share with you an exclusive first look at my new book called The New Apartheid. And the book really makes a provocative argument that apartheid did not die, it was privatized. And so in this video, especially for the SMWX viewers, subscribers, members, I want to give you an insight into the book, take you into the behind the scenes of some of the writing of the book, but really give you a feel for some of the arguments that I'm making, which bear on South Africa, particularly given the moment that our country is emerging from of widespread unrest, many people questioning the very foundations of our democracy. And I think that this is a key moment for us to pause, reflect, and think about where South Africa is nearly three decades since the fall of formal apartheid. And that's exactly what I tried to do in this book. So what I'll do in this episode is first just tell you the story of how this book came about. Then I'll give you the basic argument that the book makes. I'll then take you through the different chapters and what each chapter does in the book. And then finally, I'll take you through what I intend to do for the rest of this month, because the rest of this month, as I roll out this book, which by the way, is uh, selling really well, one of the top 10 books in the country on the exclusive books website, for example, really flying off the shelves. And I appreciate that. I uh, couldn't, couldn't have imagined it would happen like that. Um, but I'll tell you a bit more of that as the video unfolds. This month, I'm going to be doing deep dives into the different aspects of this book, whether we talk about law, wealth, technology, the criminal justice system, and really giving you a sense of the kinds of new provocative arguments that this book is making. So let's get into it. So I want to tell you the story of how this book started first. And after my first book, Democracy and Delusion, 10 Myths in South African Politics, which was published in 2017, I did a number of book events around the country. Those were good times when we could actually have in-person events and I went to virtually every province, spoke to thousands of people in total. And the one line that emerged in those events, which wasn't actually in my first book, but which resonated most with audiences was this line, apartheid did not die, it was privatized. And I realized as I was doing those events that that idea was a way of encapsulating people's disillusionment with the lack of progress made in South Africa's democracy in its first three decades. Not just the lack of progress, but also the persistent and continuous presence of apartheid in democratic life. And it's a popular sentiment. You often hear people say, you know, apartheid never really ended or, you know, we still feel the effects and the legacy of apartheid. But what I really wanted to do with this book was take that sentiment that you often hear expressed and delve into it in its full depth and explore that argument to what extent it holds weight, to what extent it doesn't hold weight, and to what extent we can really say, and it's a difficult conversation to have because it's a painful conversation, but to what extent we can really say we have defeated apartheid in South Africa. To what extent we can actually say that apartheid has died. That's the question that I wanted to pursue with this work. And so over a period of three years from the last book, I would jot down notes every time I had a thought that was linked to this idea, apartheid did not die, it was privatized. And those notes slowly built up over years and then I had hundreds of notes. And then in early 2020, when we all went into lockdown, I had a first draft of a kind of introductory chapter 
But I sat down and I thought, okay, well, one thing we have is time on our hands now. And I really went about writing and drafting this book. So taking all those notes that I had made, just jotting down things over three years and really collating them and trying to put them and weave them into a coherent structure. And once I had an idea of the structure in my mind, I then went about writing the first draft of the book. And then that was a very messy kind of just a first rough draft. And then as the months of 2020 rolled on, I went back to the drafts multiple times, reworked them, tried to make the book more and more coherent. And over that extremely lengthy process, a book started to emerge with five main parts and the argument started to become more and more clear in my mind until after multiple drafts, going back and forth, editors, proofreading, I finally have a book which I'm very proud of, which I think will make, I hope will make a contribution to South Africa's current discourse and which I hope you will enjoy, grapple with, disagree with, agree with, but will be provoked by. That's, that's what I really hope um, to achieve with this book. And so that's a little bit about how it came about. The book's official release date is the 28th of July, 2021, but it's actually in most South African stores already as I record this on the 25th, and you may be watching this on the 26th or thereafter. So the book is available. You can also buy the book at all bookstores. Just look at the link in the description below and you'll be able to get hold of the book and even a signed copy of the book if you want one. But let me move on to what the book actually says now that I've given you the rough background of how it was written, and let's have a look at some of the arguments that it's making. Okay, so I'd like to read you a section from this book, which comes right from the introduction, because I think this really pretty much encapsulates what I'm trying to do with this work. So it's a short passage, but let's go for it. In this book, I confront apartheid's imminence and eminence in South Africa's present. I trace apartheid's iniquities and inequities beyond 1994. To do this is to suggest that apartheid is more than a legacy, an effigy, or a reverberating echo. It is to excavate and disentomb apartheid. It is to search beyond the pomp and pantomime of South Africa's democratic passage into what the poet Lebo Mashile calls the existential crisis of a miracle overstretched. Such a move is at once shocking and familiar. Shocking because it erodes the founding myth of a nation. Familiar because it unveils an eerie and unspoken specter looming over the post-apartheid. And that's kind of how we enter this work, to take that nagging sense that apartheid still haunts South Africa and is able to adapt around the democratic constraints of the constitutional era. And to take that idea and really explore it in its full depth. And so in some ways, this book is difficult to read because it really digs up some of the long suppressed traumas that we have experienced as a nation. But unless we do excavate them and look at them in the eye, we can't actually uproot apartheid. And as you'll see when you read the book, we haven't even begun to uproot apartheid. The mere delegislation of apartheid, the mere change of apartheid statutes and laws is just the first and most superficial block of apartheid, which has been partially dismantled. But its economic edifice, its technological edifice, its psychological effects, its effects on wealth, on space, 
on the geographical distribution of opportunity, on land, on a host of questions. A part date not only hasn't been addressed, but is developing an ability to reinvent itself in new guises and in new forms, even as South Africa enters a democratic moment. And so really the fundamental argument of the book is that apartheid is not incompatible with democracy. In other words, democracy is not the opposite of apartheid, as we have often been told. In other words, again, apartheid can thrive even within a democratic setting. And democracy is not the antithesis of apartheid. Only uprooting apartheid is the opposite of apartheid, not just the imposition of democracy. The vote or giving people the vote cannot fix what denying them the vote has broken. So that's a little rundown of the argument. As you can see, it's going to ruffle a lot of feathers. But quite frankly, at the moment, we are in our country where we can see the very foundations of our society coming apart and cracking. And I think at, at a time when we all know that the sheer desperation that that continues to engulf South Africa is totally unsustainable. And at a moment when we can see the stark inequalities in very sharp relief because of two years virtually of COVID, but also all the economic injustice that preceded COVID. At that time, I think it's important to reassess the very foundations of, of this democracy and of this republic itself. And we can only do that if we diagnose the problem properly. It's not just a question of inequality. It's not just a question of poverty and unemployment or even racial injustice or gender injustice. What we have is a new form of apartheid. And unless we see that in all its complexity, but also simplicity, then we will constantly fail to address the actual problem, which is the root of many of the other problems which stem from it. So how does the book move from the passage I've read you? So the introduction really introduces to the idea of the new apartheid and it defines what I mean by the new apartheid. It also says what I'm not arguing. So I'm not claiming that South Africa is exactly the same as it was before 1994 etc. So it kind of limits the argument, explains how I am actually defining these terms and then throws forward to the meat of the book. And this is five chapters which look at the new apartheid in different spheres of South African life. So the first chapter looks at space. And what I mean by that is geography, the way that apartheid is still present in segregation between races particularly, but in multiple ways in South African cities, in rural areas, in the spaces between rural areas and cities. I take a deep dive into the way that space is still indicative of apartheid in South Africa today. Then the chapter after that moves to law. And I take a look at the constitution and I take aim at this idea that the constitution is capable of fundamentally reorienting South African society away from the new apartheid. That its ambitions, while noble in many respects, are fundamentally limited in such a way that they are incapable of realizing a true uprooting of the new apartheid. Then after looking at the law chapter, I move on to wealth, and this is probably the most well-known area in which apartheid is felt. Despite democracy, economic inequality has been completely impervious to freedom uh, to vote and, and the franchise. And we've seen, even in this democratic setting, 
massive wealth inequality along racial lines still to this day. And I explore that and I explore the way that wealth since 1994 transmuted and transformed and changed form but didn't necessarily change hands. And then after that, I look at technology. And this is a really uh, exciting chapter for me because we often don't realize that 1994 coincided really with the rise of the internet and personal computing. And so the democratic setting in South Africa has really coincided with a particularly technological era in human life, but also in South African life. And so one way in which the new apartheid differs from apartheid as we know it is that it has assumed increasingly digitized and algorithmicized forms and formats. And I explore this in the realm of social media, in the realm of algorithms. And I argue that in many ways, the social categorization that we see today dwarfs even that that we, we saw in apartheid. And in a place like South Africa, that's a very dangerous setting in which to find ourselves. And then finally, I look at punishment, or in other words, the criminal justice system. And here, I take a look at the criminal system, justice system, all the way from policing and the way that policing has become privatized through security, private security forces, now far outstripping the number of police and military personnel in South Africa. And then trace it all the way into the actual court system, the way that money controls that system, but also the way that even criminal prosecution is starting to become privatized itself. And the state's ineptitude is leaving space for private actors to fulfill the role even of prosecution. And then finally, I look at the system of correctional punishment or, the, or correctional facilities, otherwise known as prisons in South Africa. And interestingly, in distinction to the United States, South Africa still has a largely state-run correctional uh, correctional system but within that state-run system there's a great deal of outsourcing and so there's been a kind of privatization from within and so Bosasa for example now African Global Operations made its way to its great fortune by burrowing into this private prison system um, which is really a state system but has a number of major contracts that go out to private, private companies. And so I trace the, the system of punishment we have and I show that ultimately, it's still disproportionately black people and often black men within the criminal justice system who are punished by the system. And worse still, it's those who commit petty crimes, drug-related offenses, who are swelling our criminal justice system when in actual fact the people who commit serious violent crimes are prosecuted at horrendous rates rates below 10 percent sometimes often just two percent so we've built a system of criminal punishment within this democratic setting where we are disproportionately punishing minor offenses and we saw this with for example, the recent unrest that broke out across South Africa. It's not the people who have committed serious offenses, just like with corruption. It's not the people who've, who've really masterminded the major corruption, who are still in very high positions in, in government, even to this day, or at least stayed silent while the state was looted on a prodigious scale. We, we saw with the, the unrest that swept South Africa, it's the, it's the minor offenses that get punished. It's people who the police can use as a symbol for their action. And so people start to think, oh, the police must be doing something. But in actual fact, they're doing nothing about the most important 
and, and the most serious contraventions of the law. And then finally, in the cl conclusion of the book, I try to tie things together and look forward to where we go from here. And in a nutshell, um, I won't spoil it, but I make some quite far reaching proposals for how to uproot the new apartheid, which go way beyond just policy or new political parties or anything of that sort. It's about a fundamental reorientation of not only the constitution, but the society itself. So I really hope you enjoy the book. Over the next few weeks, I'm going to be diving deeper into each of these chapters so that you can get a greater feel for the book. I would really hope that you would read this book and share your thoughts with me. Buy the book down below. As I said, you can buy a signed copy on my website. It's available in all stores in South Africa. It's also available as an ebook for those of you who are outside South Africa. And drop me an email at hello at cswembofuwalsh.com if you have read the book, if you're interested in the work, if you want to know more about how, how to actually get the book as well. Otherwise, check all the links in the description below. And I really look forward to our engagements over the next month as we dissect this work, which I really hope will live for a long time and which I really hope will make an impact on you. The new apartheid. So thanks for watching. And by the way, to those of you who became members, I have chosen the first four people who became members of this channel to get a copy of this book signed for free and I'll deliver it to you. Um, so if you were one of the first four people to become a member, comment down below if you want to know how to get your free copy of the book. Um, I've also dropped you some messages you can also email me on that email address, hello at cesarembofowalsh.com and I'll make sure you get your book. Look forward to chatting. Look forward to speaking about this work in more depth over the next month. Spread the fire. Aye. Ah, yeah, yeah.